April 30, 1945, the wolf's lair. The war is lost, every German soldier and citizen knows this, and nobody feels the sting of impending defeat more bitterly than Adolf Hitler, Fuhrer of the Third and hopefully Final Reich. His dreams of a thousand-year German Reich are over, and with Soviet forces closing in quickly to the east, the Americans and their allies on the west, the noose is literally tightening around Hitler's neck. He'll die for what he's done. There's no doubt about that. If captured by the Soviets, there's no telling what tortures and humiliation await him. He is, after all, the mastermind behind the deaths of millions upon millions of Soviet citizens and soldiers. Then there's the many tens of thousands that were starved, experimented on, or simply executed in his POW camps, all with his direct approval. He'd nearly brought the Soviet Union to its knees, and now it was out for blood. Entire Soviet units were weathering withering defensive fire and rushing past German units simply to get to Hitler before he could disappear. Soviet spies had for months been prowling the countryside, all on the hunt for the war's greatest prize, Hitler's head. To the west, the once nearly defeated French and British were being led across the Rhine by a massive bulwark of American firepower. French forces stung with bitter defeat and were eager for their own revenge. He hadn't been as heavy-handed in France as he'd been with the Soviets, but his forces had still carried out many abuses and atrocities under his watch. The humiliation of having lost their capital also spurred the French forces on. The British had narrowly escaped utter annihilation at Dunkirk, and contemplating these dark last days of the war, Hitler kicks himself mentally for his foolishness. It had been him who had given the order for advancing panzer forces to stop, confident that there was no need to rush the offensive, and he had plenty of time to crush the British forces with their backs to the sea. His generals had begged him to reconsider, but the Fuhrer's word is law, and none may question it. The concentration camps that dotted Europe were filled with those who had. His failure to eradicate the British expeditionary force when he had the chance meant that Operation Sea Lion, meant to take the British island had become a strategic impossibility. With Britain out of the war, the United States would never have been able to invade fortress Europe. The island nation was absolutely integral for the consolidation of American expeditionary firepower and as a jumping off point for the invasion. The Americans, perhaps they would be more lenient with him. After all, relatively speaking, he hadn't committed any atrocities against them. It'd been the Japanese who'd given them a good and proper bloody nose. The capture of Tokyo should vent most of their anger. But the Americans were already even now maneuvering for a greater share of the world stage. They'd seen the future and were poised to seize it for themselves. For too long, they'd sat in their hemisphere of the planet, and with the world's greatest empires in ruins, it was their chance to take the reins of global leadership. That meant that they'd have to establish their international legitimacy which in itself meant one thing, Hitler would be tried and indubitably executed for his crimes. There was no escaping his fate, or was there? Hitler gathers his two most loyal and remaining aides. Both know the stakes and what will happen if their beloved leader is captured. Secrecy is of the utmost importance. The only other conspirators in on the plot are a dentist, himself a loyal supporter of the Fuhrer, and his beloved Eva Braun. Two Jewish prisoners from a local concentration camp have been specifically chosen for what comes next. His aides had scoured all available stock from concentration camps across Germany, and what little territory the Wehrmacht still controlled, until they found a man and woman who both matched the age and general build and height of the Fuhrer and his wife. They'd been secretly taken to meet with Hitler's dentist, who, through painstaking effort lasting many hours, had filed and scraped to perfectly reproduce a copy of the Fuhrer and his wife's teeth. Then, the woman had been poisoned with cyanide and the man shot through the temple. The dentist had been shot shortly after. No loose ends could be left behind. The two bodies were moved into position outside the wolf's lair, then set on fire until only unrecognizable bones remained. This had been kept secret even from his own guards, who had been simply alerted that the Fuhrer had committed suicide, and his body immediately burned per his request. The two piles of bone and ash would be left behind for the Soviets to discover, and Hitler was betting that the difficulty of identifying the remains accurately, as well as Stalin's refusal to publicly admit Hitler may have evaded his grasp, would lead them to declare that they had indeed found Hitler's remains. Dental records would prove the identity. Now Hitler and his wife, wearing disguises, are rushed to a waiting jeep. The exodus of personnel from the Wolf Slayer is the perfect cover for the German Fuhrer to make his escape from the bunker without arousing suspicion. The fanatical SS guards that remained would fight to the death, believing the place to be a place of honor. Or perhaps they'd simply surrender, knowing that the war was truly well and over. It mattered little to Hitler at this point. From the force of Germany, Hitler travels south and into Switzerland. A hefty bribe convinces the border guards to allow the unknown Germans through. High-ranking Germans have been fleeing for weeks now, and bribing Swiss border guards was nothing new. For the guards, it was a chance to enrich themselves, and as long as it was kept quiet, no one would ever be the wiser. Hitler must hurry, though because his opportunity to escape is quickly closing. He traveled across Switzerland and finally into Italy, where they successfully hide among streams of refugees
refugees pouring across the border. There are still fascist supporters in Italy, stinging from the loss of the war and the murder of Mussolini, and a former Italian intelligence agent meets up with the Fuhrer and his escort, helping them get to the coast. Late at night, outside a small Italian fishing village, the Fuhrer and his escorts fire up a single flare into the sky. A mile off the shore is a German U-boat, on station for the last week. It doesn't dare surface except at night to recharge its batteries, and has been sitting off the Italian coast waiting for the agreed-upon signal. Lookouts on the deck of the U-boat spot the flare and hurriedly shout to the captain below. On the beach, the group spots the countersign, two bright flashes of a spotlight followed by one long flash. Dragging a rowboat to the surf, the Fuhrer and his wife, his two aides, and the Italian spy all make their way to the waiting submarine. As they near it, the captain and an armed escort are waiting for them. They throw a rope out to the small dinghy to help pull it in. First off the boat is the Fuhrer, and then his wife, Miss Braun. As the first aide attempts to climb up the rope ladder lowered to them, though, he's shoved back into the boat by a sailor. Without warning, the armed sailors open fire, killing the two aides and the fascist spy. Without a word, the captain of the U-boat drops an incendiary grenade into the boat, and in moments, it's a scorching inferno. The boat will sink, and the final bit of evidence hinting Hitler might have escaped the Allies' grasp will go to the bottom of the Mediterranean with them. Once inside the submarine, Hitler settles into the captain's own personal cabin. He looks at his beloved wife, and and after two weeks on the run breathes a final sigh of relief. Even now, news is spreading throughout Europe and the world that the German Führer is dead. Efforts to locate his dental records and authenticate the discovery, though, are underway. The Americans and the British are asking for access to the body to do their own confirmation, but the Soviets are so far refusing. Even now, tensions are flaring between the former allies, and as the German U-boat pulls away from the coast, Hitler wishes nothing more than the damn communists and arrogant Americans tearing each other's throat out. Perhaps then, he might be able to return. Once the Soviets and the Americans have destroyed each other, Hitler could return from his exile and lead the German people to ultimate triumph over his two weakened armies. He tells his plan to Eva, who smiles in delight, nodding her approval. The thought of his triumphant return and the U-boat captain's warm bed is the first bit of comfort he's had in weeks. Hitler fancies himself a Napoleon as he drifts off to sleep, returning from exile to triumphantly lead his people into the glory he deserves. For the next few days, the U-boat steams beneath the waves as it makes its way to the Strait of Gibraltar. The trip takes longer than usual as the submarine must carefully avoid Allied vessels and merchant ships of all kinds. By now, the Kriegsmarine has officially surrendered, and the Allies are demanding a full register of all operational U-boats and verifying the surrender of their crews. The last thing they want is a renegade U-boat attempting to earn itself a final bit of revenge by taking on unwary ships with its remaining stores of weapons and fuel. But the real reason is the Allies don't want more senior German leadership slipping through their grasp, spirited away to safety around the globe thanks to the stealthy U-boats. Luckily for Hitler, German military records have been scattered or lost in the chaos of the invasion of Germany, and it'll be time yet before his U-boat's disappearance is noticed. As the submarine approaches the Strait of Gibraltar, though, it enters the most dangerous part of its journey. Here, Allied forces have established a picket of warships for most of the war. Hitler's hope is the crews have been pacified by the victory, and not manning their posts as diligently as they should be. Whether that's the case or not, the U-boat successfully moves past the Allied picket, diving to its maximum depth and running almost imperceptibly silently. When no depth charges rain down around them, the men breathe a sigh of relief. Ahead is the Atlantic Ocean, where it would take a miracle to find them. The most difficult part of his journey is well and truly over. Freedom is now all but guaranteed. Retiring to his cabin, Hitler begins writing his new memoir. His new Reich will need a new source of inspiration, something to lift the broken spirits of his people and spur them to future glory. All the pieces are in place. The Soviets and Americans have all but forgotten their wartime cooperation, and the stage seems to be set in Europe for a decisive confrontation between the two. Hitler is confident the Americans will win. Theirs is the superior navy, and their military hasn't suffered nearly as much as the Soviet war machine has. More to the point, much of the Soviet military relied on abundant American aid, everything from boots to ammunition, food, blankets, and even the tens of thousands of trucks that made the Great Red Army's counterattack possible all came from America. The Soviet Union was a land in ruin, and without US aid, it would never be able to defeat it. The US, though, would learn the same bitter lesson Hitler had learned and pay dearly for every mile of Soviet territory it was forced to fight for. Stalin had refused defeat even when victory for the Wehrmacht seemed all but inevitable, and his forces were besieging his namesake city. He'd never accept defeat at the hands of the Americans. The long, bitter war would result in an American win, but they would be thoroughly expanded and exhausted of war by then. Hitler needed only return in glory to his people, inspire them to rise up, and the Americans would simply let him. They would never have the stomach or resources to wage yet a third war. Then the gloriously reborn Third Reich would easily annihilate its utterly spent and decimated opponents claiming Europe for Hitler. 
but he'd have to bide his time until the moment to strike was at hand. The U-boat makes its way across the Atlantic, able to move on the surface now that the threat of discovery is negligible. Hitler is glad for this. Not only will the submarine move faster on the surface, but it gives him a chance to take in fresh air on the deck. He'd never let any of his men know it, but he's terrified of tight spaces. And frankly, the stink of several dozen unwashed men was strong enough to taste it, no matter how good the air recyclers worked. As the sun sets, the U-boat continues on its course to Argentina. Though cross south of Patagonia, where the submarine can remain submerged and ignore the historically tumultuous Antarctic weather that plagues the area year-round. Fuel will run out before then, but the Kriegsmarine has established several small refueling stations across the Atlantic on tiny islands which remain undiscovered by former allies. These are meant to be used in emergencies only and are unmanned, forcing the crew to refuel the boats themselves. With the stars twinkling in the skies above him, Hitler considers them and what glorious future prophecies they may hold for him. He has been defeated, yes, but setbacks are nothing new to him. He arose from a faceless, insignificant soldier on the front lines of World War I to lead the greatest nation the world had ever known and he'll do it again, even if he must endure humiliating exile for a few years first. But here in the open Atlantic, the stars are bright, and so is Adolf Hitler's future. He may be in the middle of a bitter winter now, but soon it'll be springtime for Hitler. All he has to do is wait. This was obviously a fictitious story, or was it? While Hitler remains were indeed authenticated by the Soviet Union, they never let American or British personnel take a good look at them until much later after their discovery. Even then, they refused to allow them to take bone samples, which would have helped to authenticate the remains. While most believe that the remains were indeed those of Hitler, due to x-rays of Hitler's skull taken a year before his death, it is fair to say that there remains some doubt, and the last thing that Stalin would have wanted is for his people to know, let alone the world, that the Soviet Union's greatest enemy had indeed fled his grasp. So. Maybe our story is more a reality than fiction after all. By now, Hitler would be dead, and the truth may never be known.